So join me please now in welcoming Leo Panitch as he discusses his new book, The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of the American Empire, in a talk that he's titled American Crisis, Global Crisis. Leo. Thank you very much, Randy. You said it was going to be embarrassing, and I thought you had some dirt on me. Uh, but it was, it was embarrassing, nevertheless. Uh, it, it's really uh, wonderful to be back here. Uh, Randy invited me to do this uh, a little bit over a year ago when he was still chair of the political science department. And Sam and I were desperately trying to finish this book that we've been working on for a decade. And I said, no, I can't possibly interrupt to do this, but if you invite me next year, when the book's done, I'd be happy to come, and I am indeed really happy to be here. Um, you know, in many ways, uh, my heart is still here. Uh, I was 27 years old when I got a job at Carleton. Uh, many of my closest lifelong friends uh, uh, I met when I came to Ottawa uh, in 1972, uh, and in the years immediately after that. And, uh, you know, I have all the more a special relationship with this place because my daughter teaches here now uh, in the Department of Philosophy, much more profound than what we do, uh, Jermaine. Um, and indeed, she just ran out to buy me uh, another thing of water because I have a bit of a cold, as you can tell, uh, and I hope uh, my voice holds up. Uh, the talk I'm going to give is not so much about the book, although obviously the analysis is derived very much from it. Uh, it is about uh, how did it come to be that a crisis that began in the American housing market uh, became the first great crisis of the 21st century. Uh, we're now five years into that global crisis with no sign that it's coming to an end. And given its length and depth and global extent, uh, it probably definitely qualifies as, uh, uh, as the fourth great crisis of capitalist history. The first uh, that began after 1873 and lasted off and on until the mid-1890s, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, the crisis of the 1970s, uh, and now we're in the fourth great crisis of, of capitalism. Uh, it deserves to be called, in my view, the American crisis, in the same way that we spoke in 1997-98 of the Asian crisis, the crisis that began in Thailand, spread to Korea, uh, but by the following year, of course, it spread to Brazil, to Russia, and even to Wall Street with the collapse of long-term capital management, uh, threatening to bring down the financial system then. But that's still known as the Asian crisis. And this crisis, which began in the United States, deserves to be called, because of its origins, the American crisis. Um, the way it spread so quickly and, wisely, and widely uh, was captured, actually, in November 2007. People often speak of that crisis as had this crisis having begun in 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, it didn't. Uh, it began in the mortgage market in the summer of 2007. Uh, uh, a French bank, which had uh, BNP Paribas, which had very heavily loaded up with American mortgage securities, uh, was, uh, couldn't turn over its debt. Uh, and uh, uh, the American Treasury and Federal Reserve uh, were... Uh, on the phone uh, full-time uh, with central bankers and finance ministers around the world from the beginning of August on, trying to contain that crisis. And uh, The Onion, the marvelous satirical newspaper that emanates from New York, had a headline in November 2007 uh, that went as follows, Bush proud U.S. economic woes can still uh, upset world markets. <laughs> Uh, yet is this a crisis, even if it's the American crisis, is it a crisis of American hegemony? Is it a crisis of the American informal empire? Uh, this is an empire that has superintended, and that's a term that Sam and I use very deliberately uh, to understand the role of the American state, 
that has superintended the spread of capitalist globalization. Not only as most people think over the past three neoliberal decades, but has in fact superintended the spread of capitalist globalization since the Second World War. Uh, and the nature of the American empire, I think, is very important uh, to understand, uh, is that it has very largely been an empire by invitation. Although we all, of course, are aware of American uh, military uh, interventions around the world. Although we know there are something like 150 American military bases around the world. Uh, although we know of the daring do of the CIA uh, uh, in uh, ensuring uh, that uh, states that the United States wants to stay in its camp stays in its camp, and some of those that aren't in its camp will come into its camp. Uh, what all of that tends to miss by its focus on the coercive side of empire is the extent to which uh, the United States has uh, played a role in superintending global capitalism by protecting uh, ruling classes around the world insofar as uh, they adhere to the laws of contract, insofar as they protect private property, insofar as they are committed over time, not necessarily overnight, uh, to open their borders to the free flow of capital and to the free flow of goods. Uh, it is an empire not in the sense of extended political rule through the conquest of territory, it is an empire through the penetration and incorporation of other sovereign states under its umbrella in the management of capitalism, in the reproduction and the spread of capitalism. Uh, and in that sense, it has since 1945 come to be seen by the, the world's capitalist classes as their ultimate state, the state that will ultimately protect their property, that will ultimately protect their role in the world. And the American state, conversely, is not only, and maybe not even, spreading the American national interest, whatever the heck that is anyway, uh, when it uh, intervenes or manages around the world. Uh, it is, to some extent, burdened with the responsibility of reproducing the conditions of expansion and survival of accumulation for the world's capitalist classes. Uh, it, in that sense, represents global capital. At the same time, it remains its own, the state of its own social formation, of course, and reflects the various pressures, that class pressures and regional pressures, etc., that appear within social formation. That sometimes creates tensions between its global role and its domestic role, uh, as you can see often in uh, congressional antics vis-a-vis the Federal Reserve immediately opening its coffers to French banks when the crisis begins. What the hell are you doing lending money to a French bank? Uh, but the role that it plays in that respect is crucial to keeping the global financial system, including Wall Street, going, uh, with all of the central role that Wall Street plays in the integrated production of our time, uh, as I'll explain a little bit later. It was already the case by the late 1960s and the early 1970s, as the crisis of the 1970s was already well in train. The crisis of the dollar uh, uh, that uh, led to the breakdown of Bretton Woods in the sense of ending the system of fixed exchange rates of all the world's currencies to the dollar uh, and the dollar's link to gold. Uh, it was already at that time uh, as the crisis of profitability not only of American corporations, but of the corporations of all the advanced capitalist states, uh, were being squeezed, uh, both by worker militancy from below and by the uh, nationalist policies of states in the global south that were pushing up commodity prices. Uh, it was already at the time of the emergence of that crisis of the 1970s that it became very common both on the left and amongst mainstream social scientists, and indeed very much on the right, to argue that American hegemony was being lost. Uh, the whole field within political science of international political economy is founded 
on the premise that so long as America was a benevolent empire with the Marshall Plan, they didn't call it an empire, uh, and went out of their way to make it easy for uh, the Europeans and the Japanese to recover, etc., the United States would be hegemonic because it was taking the interests of uh, other nation states into, and they meant other capitalist classes, into consideration. With the breakdown of Bretton Woods, with Nixon's introduction of an import surcharge, uh, with the realignment of currencies that inevitably followed from the flexible exchange rates being introduced, America appeared to be acting in its self-interest, and all of these liberal and social democratic political scientists wanted the ear of Washington to say, hey, don't be selfish. If you're selfish, you'll lose your hegemony. Marxists like Ernest Mandel, seeing uh, Germany now becoming a major exporter to the United States, seeing Japan do the same, seeing Germany at the center of a expansive European project, uh, argued uh, in many places, including in late capitalism, that what we were seeing was the reemergence of inter-imperial rivalry. Uh, on the right, of course, uh, with uh, the fiasco in Vietnam, there was this despair, this hand-wringing over the decline of the American Empire, etc. Uh, but usually that was not only related to that military quagmire, but also to the economic woes uh, that were taking place at the time. Uh, but in fact, uh, as the great Greek Marxist uh, political scientist Nikos Poulantzas uh, understood better than anyone at the time, uh, there was, as he put it, in a book in 1972, there was no solution to the crisis uh, by European bourgeoisies attacking American capital. The question for them is rather to reorganize a hegemony that they still accept. And that is precisely the situation today. Precisely the situation today. During the 1960s and 70s, now after the recovery from Europe and Japan, very much fostered by uh, the United States, partly through uh, exchange rates that were very favorable uh, to the uh, exports of those countries to the vast American market. Um, uh, after the recovery of those countries, that did indeed uh, lead to the breakdown of Bre Bretton Woods, but at the same time it led to much closer integration between those states and their economies and the American state and its economy. American multinationals, once uh, the welfare state was in place in Europe, uh, once Japan uh, had recovered its and, and indeed vastly increased its industrial export competitiveness, uh, uh, once the currencies of Japan and Europe became convertible in 1958, uh, once the American state had done its work in that respect, and Bretton Woods had done its work in that respect, uh, you began to see an enormous flow, of course, of uh, foreign direct investment around the world. Uh, uh, above all, led initially by multinational corporations from the United States. Uh, this was very quickly followed by American banks uh, coming into Europe, uh, not only to be sources of credit, because most of the source of credit for those multinationals were European banks, uh, but in order to occupy the new euro dollar market as London merchant bankers switched their allegiance from sterling to the dollar, which they did in the late 1950s. And by the mid 1960s, it was American investment banks that dominated the euro dollar market and the euro bond market, and they still do to this day. Uh, but more than that, uh, there was a reverse flow of FDI. There was a flow come by the late 1960s coming from uh, the European countries and Japan to the United States, partly using the surplus in trade that they now have with the United States to invest in the United States, and not simply to buy treasury bills, government securities, etc., but to invest in American plants and industry and services and so on. Now, we're very familiar with this as Canadians. Right? Do you know the country that has the greatest foreign direct investment in the United States? It's Canada. That doesn't make us an imperialist power inside Canada, but immediately, as soon as that started happening, you started getting from left to right the argument that, aha, you see, Japan is dominating the United States. It's imperial vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Germany is imperial vis-a-vis -vis the United States, etc. And it was a, a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the degree of integration 
that this represented, and the extent to which that flow of foreign capital was an attempt on the part of foreign capitalists to get the American state on their side as the continuing central state in the making of global capitalism. Uh, in this respect, perhaps most missed, although not by the people who do international political economy, but most missed by others, was the very, very important coordination that started going on from the mid-1960s on between the staff, the permanent staff, in the world central banks and finance ministries to try to cope with the dollar crisis, which was as much their crisis as an American crisis, because everyone was so integrated and dependent on the dollar as the global reserve currency. And you started getting these very, very regular meetings amongst the staff of these domestic central economic agencies. And they developed a lot of camaraderie amongst each other, which lasted for decades. They developed a lot of expertise in attempting to coordinate the management of uh, prices. Uh, moreover, uh, they realized that it often would be easier for their governments to pass certain policies through their legislatures if they could blame it on the G10 or the G7 or now the G20 or the IMF or the World Bank. They made us do it. And in fact, they would go to these meetings saying, look, if you can issue a, if we can get a communique out of this meeting that says this is necessary, we'll be able to shift the balance of forces inside our country to get through a policy that uh, you know, capitalists have been calling for in our country, but we can't get through given the balance of forces in our country. And people who don't understand that tend to see structural adjustment by the IMF as simply an external imposition. But in almost every instance, if you look at it closely, the policies introduced through structural adjustment by the IMF when a country gets into difficulties are policies that the strongest elements of that particular state's capital and certainly uh, very important elements inside the state economic apparatus have been pushing for but haven't been able to get through domestically given the balance of forces inside the country. Now this begins in the 1960s and that coordination which is the root of what becomes the G7 by the mid-1970s, is enormously important in ensuring that the kinds of tensions, the kinds of contradictions that emerge with these economic crises are contained. Uh, and and uh, it was through the course of the 1970s that people predicted after the breakdown of Bretton Woods this would interrupt international trade. Uh, people predicted, indeed, our colleague Eric Kaliner in a marvelous book in 1996 uh, on the state and financialization looked at the 1970s crisis and said the Europeans and the Japanese wanted capital controls and these right-wingers in the Nixon Treasury didn't. And Sure, this was the line that you might have gotten superficially, but in fact the coordination at these types of meetings was such uh, that that wasn't at all the case. There was virtually no fundamental disagreement between them. They were looking to reorganize the system of uh, uh, dollar finance, but they in no sense were looking to uh, interrupt the deep integration that had already occurred, and they were all committed to ensuring went much, much further. Uh, there was pressure, and it was not insignificant pressure, uh, to secure the value of the dollar against inflation, insofar as the dollar was the, measure, the abstract measure of global value, insofar as it was the main unit of accounting in global capitalism, insofar as it was the main mechanism of trade uh, in terms of currencies. Uh, every state in the world had, that was linked into global capitalism had an interest in ensuring that the value of the dollar was not undermined, above all those that were holding a surplus of American dollars because of their trade with the United States, Germans and Japanese above all, but not only. And certainly they were putting pressure on the Americans uh, to deal with that problem. Uh, this is an example of how an informal empire is very different from a colony. Uh, it is subject to pressure from the states that, the sovereign states that lie within it. Now, insofar as the main, Sam and I differ here with many uh, other interpretations of that crisis, but in our view, uh, and I've always held this view, and I taught it here 
at York in the 1970s to the chagrin of many uh, of my friends in the labor movement. Uh, in our view, the main source of that inflation was indeed worker militancy. Was indeed the 35% wage demand, increased demands that nurses were making as they organized. And why shouldn't they have made those demands? Uh, well, it was indeed the pressure coming from social movements as they uh, secured uh, additional services, uh, as they secured uh, rising incomes uh, for public sector workers, uh, leaving aside, and this was probably most important, the militancy taking place in private sector unions, especially in the manufacturing sector. Uh, so, and, and most states identify the problem as wage inflation, as wage push inflation. And that's why when leftists said, yeah, the problem is this union militancy that is producing inflation, uh, that is the way the capitalist system is presently coping with a uh, squeeze on profits. Uh, uh, when that was said, of course, many people in the union movement thought you were saying the same things as the bourgeoisie was saying, that you're blaming the unions for the problem. Uh, it wasn't so much blaming it as realizing that Class is a relationship, and in that relationship, workers have power, although it's a very asymmetric power, and they were under conditions of full employment exercising it, although in a very narrow way, an, a way that reflected wage militancy in order to get more money to be able to buy all the consumer goods that capitalism was producing. In that way, realized the American dream. Uh, uh, and, and it was realized uh, on the part of all of the capitalist states involved under the American umbrella that however much they repressed that militancy, it wouldn't fundamentally be resolved until the United States did the same. And it was only with the 1979-80 Volcker shock when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to 18% and were prepared to let unemployment go as hard as it needed to go in order to break that militancy that you really had a resolution uh, to the crisis of uh, the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and you got with that the famous turn to what is now so commonly called, well, not so much outside the halls of academe, neoliberalism. Uh, it came along with the Japanese and the British under Thatcher removal of all capital controls just at the same time that the Volcker shock was introduced. Uh, it came along with the implementation on the part of Americans of what they had evolved in the 1970s uh, their uh, bilateral investment treaties, which originally was just a model agreement that they had no idea would spread the way it did, but it was the basis of the free trade agreement with Canada, it was the basis of uh, the WTO eventually, and of the literally hundreds of bilateral investment treaties that have been signed, uh, not only with the United States and other countries, but by countries amongst themselves bilaterally. Uh, and they. The, the, we think about free trade as primarily about removing tariffs, but for the most part, especially amongst the advanced capitalist countries, uh, tariffs had largely come down uh, to, a, to a degree that they didn't cause much friction uh, in the post-war era already. Uh, the uh, free trade was really about the free trade in services, and it really was about guaranteeing that foreign capital would be treated as national capital when it went to another country. That was the fundamental principle. Uh, and what went with that, ironically, was a provision in American jurisprudence known as the takings doctrine, uh, highly contested in the American courts. Uh, way back in the 19th century, the Supreme Court had ruled that if you pass some um, planning restriction on property, uh, even a tax in some cases, that has the effect of putting this or that firm out of business. This can be treated as an expropriation without compensation, and therefore it's unconstitutional. Well, this is what was built into Chapter 11 of the Free Trade Agreement, the VAPTA, right? and it was central to all BITs. It was highly contested in the American courts. It was never a settled matter of law in the United States, but it was built into international law in a way that, for a period at least, was much less contested. It was an example of the way in which it isn't just a matter of Reagan's ideology or Thatcher's ideology that was so central to neoliberalism, but it was indeed the very legal fab fabric of the American state and what is more state than courts and laws uh, that was built into this period. 
Now, at that time, especially if you were on the left, uh, not a revolutionary on the left, but you very much wanted not to succumb to the enormous inequality, the defeat of trade unionism that came with competitiveness becoming the central goal of all societies under neoliberalism, you tried to find examples of societies that were open markets, oriented to trade, uh, high growth, had conquered inflation, and yet were socially just. And we settled on uh, Sweden and Germany, and a whole literature developed in political science known as the varieties of capitalism literature. There are these weak states, represented above all by the United States, a weak state, huh? uh, and Britain, right? which don't intervene much with industry and, and industrial planning. And there are strong states, represented by the state representing barely 10 million people called Sweden, the size of Cuba, right? uh, or Germany, that have coordinated capitalism rather than liberal market economies. And their coordinated market economies are marked by the fact that they have corporatist relationships between <laughs> business, labor, and the state, and they're marked by very close integration between finance and industry, whereas the United States characteristically has always had a much more in, indirect relationship between finance and industry, uh, where there are no direct links between banks and industrial corporations, as very famously there are in Germany. There's a commercial paper market, there is a stock market, uh, there is a corporate bond market uh, where uh, people buy uh, in a much more indirect way uh, the uh, obligations of uh, American industry. And what it was uh, argued was that, look, you can have a socially just as well as highly efficient capitalism without succumbing to neoliberal precepts, without listening to neoclassical economists. Uh, you don't have to have a smaller state or a weak state in order to have a competitive, socially just capitalist state. And what was missed by this, and it was a very, very, I think, formative argument, not only in uh, the social sciences, but also in the political sphere on the left, what was missed by this was that it tended to treat, astonishingly, when you think about the degree of integration that had been going on since 1945, it tended to treat the uh, coordinated market uh, economies and the liberal market economies as though they were watertight compartments, as though they didn't have this increasingly deep interpenetration. Right? Uh, and, of course, just as they were writing this stuff, uh, just as they were try car carrying policy coals to the furnaces of Washington, uh, making this argument in the hope that it would uh, perhaps make Clinton not end welfare as we know it, uh, because after all, the Swedes still had a welfare state, uh, and nevertheless, we're still exporting a lot. Uh, just as they were doing this, Europe was being transformed. Uh, it was being transformed to look very, very much like the United States. Increasingly like, and it's not to say that Sweden, although it has the greatest uh, growth in inequality of any OECD country over the last 20 years, isn't still a hell of a lot better to place to live in if you're poor, or at least if you're poor and not an immigrant. It is a better place to live. Uh, but there was a dynamic going on that was undoing the coordinated market economy. Uh, and that was evident in all kinds of ways. Goldman Sachs moved from its London base, which was already established in the 1970s, uh, to increasingly be the uh, firm uh, that when, the, at one time, the largest IPO in the world took place, uh, French Total was privatized, it underwrote that privatization. It was Goldman Sachs. Uh, when Deutsche Telekom was privatized, Goldman Sachs advised the German Bundes, uh, the, the legislature, on how that privatization should be carried out, and then it, jointly with Deutsche Bank, the Germany's largest bank, carried out that IPO. And Deutsche Bank, just as these brilliant social scientists of the social democratic left were making the case for coordinated market economies, Deutsche Bank was turning itself into a facsimile of American investment banks. 
divesting of itself of its direct ownership of industry, and indeed arguing that if it didn't do so, as it engaged in these kinds of IPOs, it would be in conflict of interest. Uh, so there was a transformation going on inside Europe, very much accelerated, of course, by uh, the move to uh, economic and monetary union from the mid-1980s on, leading to the common currency. Uh, Europe took the lead, in fact, in opening uh, the capital markets around the world. In some senses, were more active than the American state was in, in doing so. Uh, now, that's entirely to leave aside the role of uh, U.S. law firms and accounting firms in the making of global capitalism, not least in Europe and, and uh, even in Asia. Uh, the largest uh, accounting firms in the world, accounting is dominated by five large firms. One of them went under in the uh, crisis of the late 1990s and that led to the Enron crisis, of course, Arthur Anderson, uh, but they continue to dominate it. Uh, the vast expansion of U.S. corporate law firms uh, all around the world, uh, which we have a table on in the book, it's, it's astonishing, uh, is part of this, because if you're going to be dealing with international law that is, in fact, based on American law, who do you want to go for for advice but to an American corporate law firm? Uh, so there was a reproduction at the international level of the American empire through the era of neoliberalism, which uh, made the varieties of capitalism argument uh, increasingly threadbare. Uh, there was also an enormous emulation of U.S. economic success. Uh, we don't like to admit this, but after the uh, crisis of the 1970s was ended by the breaking of wage push inflation, by the ending of the expansion of the welfare state. Uh, after 1983, if you look at it from starting from then rather than from during the crisis, 1973, after 1983, right up to 2007, uh, American productivity rates were much higher than they were in the 1950s and 60s. American growth rates were very close to what they were in the 1950s and 60s, etc. Uh, yes, it's very true uh, that wages stagnated, that there was an enormous growth in inequality. Right? Absolutely true. Uh, and many people don't like to say, well, you have a dynamic capitalist economy if not everybody's doing well in it. In fact, on the contrary, the material basis of the American empire was being reproduced on the, precisely on the basis of that growing inequality. The condition for the reproduction of the American empire in the neoliberal era was indeed the increase in exploitation that took place in the United States. And after all, it's a relatively rich proletariat we're talking about. So there's room for this. Uh, and there was an enormous emula emulation uh, of the United States, especially for its labor flexibility. One of the things that presumably characterized varieties of capitalism was that it was hard to fire, hard to fire people in Europe. Well, what the European capitalists were constantly saying was, the Americans are make, creating way, way more jobs than us. Yes, they're lower paying jobs, right? But their workers are working longer hours, they're more productive than us, and it's labor flexibility that's doing it. And they were trying to emulate the American economy, and they often, of course, did. Um, at the same time, the notion that the American economy uh, no longer sustained the American empire, uh, an argument that many people made at the time of the first Iraq war. Uh, they're going into Iraq because they're an economic basket case uh, and uh, they're getting the Europeans and Japanese to pay for the war uh, and that uh, is how we explain that military intervention. American economy was not being hollowed out, not at all. Uh, not only by virtue of the fact that as American auto plants closed, German and Japanese auto plants opened sometimes 15 miles down the road in rural Ohio if it was a parts plant, although more often it was an assembly plant, plant or more uh, in, the, in the American South that was non-unionized where you had the much more labor flexibility, etc. But apart from that, uh, you had American uh, leadership, uh, not exclusive, but in, in the whole array of high-tech production from computers, aerospace, communications equipment, scientific instruments, 
et cetera, et cetera. And American multinationals, for all of the enormous uh, growth of uh, Canadian and European and Japanese multinationals, uh, uh, American multinationals continue to dominate in almost every sphere that you could think of uh, in the global top, uh, the Fortune uh, top 500 firms. Now, this very, now, why am I doing all this? It's very important to understand this if we're to understand, first of all, the roots of the 2000-2008 crisis. A lot of people predicted that crisis, certainly much more than Sam and I did. And I kept on saying to Gindan as we were writing this book, Gindan, if this whole thing blows up, we're dead. Uh, because we were making the argument that this was, you know, a very dynamic period of capitalism we were living in. Uh, and and uh, uh, people were predicting, and we kept saying, we don't see this happening, that there's going to be a crisis because of the imbalances in the global economy. Above all, the imbalances in relation to the American trade deficit and uh, the American uh, the flow of Chinese or Japanese capital to the United States uh, that was compensating for, uh, allegedly for that trade deficit. And America was just kept going, the argument was, by virtue of the beneficence of the Chinese or Japanese. Uh, and, you know, they could easily pull that money out. Uh, if there was a blip in the economy, out it would go, uh, and the whole thing would collapse like a house of cards. And to us, that seemed extremely implausible. Because if you look at the role that Wall Street plays in the world, the role that American Treasury bills play in the world, they aren't doing them a favor when they lend them that money. And although accountants may say you have a trade deficit, therefore you need a capital flow coming in, that isn't how the world works. Uh, rather, the way the actual world works is that if you're sitting on a surplus of American dollars, the best place to invest it is the place that's producing financial instruments where you're likely to get the highest return on those dollars. And that's either the city of London, dominated by American banks, with a complete flow, open flow, from sterling to, to dollars, uh, or directly in New York, and much more likely directly in New York. Uh, of course, the additional reason that they're buying American Treasury bills and investing in the United States is that they're desperately concerned that there not be a shift in exchange rates that would disadvantage their dependence on exports to the United States. And by therefore putting the, their, or leaving their money, they never take it out of the United States. They simply earn the surplus and put it into uh, the American banking system through the purchase of American treasuries or indeed other securities. They are ensuring that the American dollar does not uh, get devalued and make it difficult therefore for those exporters to the United States to keep their exports up. They have an interest in that sense in reproducing the dominance of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And, and uh, in fact, uh, the crisis wasn't produced by imbalances. It wasn't produced by the American fiscal deficit, as so many people predicted, as Bush, as every Republican administration always does, let the deficit go through the roof with his military adventures and tax cuts. It's only the Democrats who are responsible for bringing the, the uh, budget back into balance. Uh, it's obvious this was the case in Reagan in the 1980s and Bush in the 2000s, and I assure you uh, that Obama is going to do everything he possibly can uh, to deal with the deficit, and if Romney gets in, it'll only get bigger still. Uh, that's the nature of Republicans who are only interested in uh, tax cuts for their immediate backers uh, in a very narrow sense of the word. So it didn't happen because of these deficits, either trade or fiscal. These were the imbalances that people were pointing to. It happened rather because of the volatility of capitalist finance. Uh, and it was that that Sam and I were pointing to. It wasn't the crisis of profitability of American corporations. Their profits were doing very well, in fact. In fact, in 2006, were as high as they'd been for decades. In fact, uh, uh, they were doing extremely well and re continue to do extremely well in terms of their cash flow and profitability. Um, th rather, the uh, uh, crisis had to do with the volatility of finance. Now, again, especially those of us on the left, but not only, uh, you know, rail at finance because it is speculative. Uh, and I was just asked by a young man who writes for the Charlatan, has, has finance learned its lesson? Okay. Well, yes, finance is speculative. That is the nature of finance. Right? Uh, 
what you're doing is trading a piece of paper in the hope that you'll get a higher rate of interest than what you borrowed on, essentially. And it's not producing anything directly in that sense. Uh, but finance has been absolutely central to the expansion of global production and the integration of global production over the whole period we're talking about. It is functional for it. It is necessary for it. If you're going to have free capital flows, then you have to have the type of global financial system that we now have. If you're going to have freely floating exchange rates, you can't have them. And you never could have had the type of growth in global trade that occurred after Bretton Woods if you didn't have derivatives markets. And they were developed in American financial markets in the 1970s, which allowed people to hedge what currencies would be a week from now, a month from now, six months from now. So if you're a Indian exporter that contracts with Walmart to deliver something and signs that contract in April and has to deliver it in October, there's no way you know that you're going to make a profit on this if you aren't sure that you've built in what the exchange rate will be in October as compared to what it is now, given the volatility of currency markets. So the largest derivative market in the world, where you're essentially buying and selling future, uh, futures on currencies, and people are speculating that it'll go up, it'll go down, some sell, some buy, is what you're doing is facilitating, in that sense, the integration of production and the expansion of trade. It's what Canadian farmers did from the mid-19th century on. And the expertise in those future markets were developed in Chicago, doing wheat futures, the price of wheat. You didn't know as a farmer when you put the seed into the ground in April, or in the Canadian case, usually in May, uh, what, at, what the price of wheat would be when you harvested it in the fall. Right? And they're through this long, you go to your local bank or credit union and you would essentially buy a guarantee of what the price of wheat would be six months from now. Well, that's what derivatives are. And it's speculation all the way along, but it's absolutely functional to, find, to, to production. Right? It's above all functional to the globally integrated production. Now, it's functional, but what Marxists understand which so few others understand, is that something that is functional can at the same time be dysfunctional. That's what Marxists mean by contradiction. Right? And yes, finance is highly volatile precisely because of the extent to which it is based on speculation. Uh, now, this crisis comes out of that volatility in finance. There were 72 financial crises in low and middle income countries in the 1990s alone. Right? The American Treasury by the end of the 1990s was defining its main role as that of failure containment. Right? Very explicitly they said we can't be in the business of failure prevention because if we're in the business of failure prevention we will be preventing the discovery of financial instruments that are the essential lifeblood of globalization. But we are in the business of failure containment. So when there's a crisis, we rush in and try to coordinate with other states, or we throw liquidity into the banking system in order to try to contain this crisis to rebuild the confidence of finance. And that's what they were doing all the way along. And they were only doing it in relation to international crises. They were doing it in relation to domestic crises. You know, Alan Greenspan is thought of as, you know, to the right of Attila the Hunt. Uh, he was one of the leading members of the Ayn Rand Society. But as soon as he became chair of the Federal Reserve, and there was a crisis in the U.S. stock market in 1987, he intervened massively. He intervened not only by throwing enormous dollars into the financial system in the face of that stock market crisis, but by getting the leading bankers in New York on the phone and telling them what to do, instructing them what to do. As J.P. Morgan used to do, during the 1907 financial crisis before you had a Federal Reserve, when you would tell the other bankers what to do. Uh, and, and that happened again, of course, uh, at the time of the long-term capital management crisis in 1998 and during the dot-com bubble crisis uh, in 2000-2001. Uh, this crisis, 
was caused out of the same kind of financial volatility, but it went deeper and was more difficult con to, to contain for a central reason. And that is that the American working class maintained its standard of living, and it did maintain it, as wages stagnated through the 1980s and 1990s. Yes, by working longer hours. Yes, by everybody in the family working. But above all, through credit. And one of the major ways in which it sustained its income was through the one major asset that is in the hands of a working class family, the family home. And there was a housing bubble. And why shouldn't working people get into it? Above all, why shouldn't uh, that portion of the American working class that has always been most marginalized from the American dream, the black American working class, try to get in? And indeed, administrations from the 1970s on, as the vast public housing that would have been needed to save and transform American cities uh, uh, needed to take place, were encouraging the banks, indeed in some cases were instructing the banks, to lend money to those areas of cities that they had previously redlined, as you shouldn't lend to. Uh, uh, the greatest, one of the great victories of the 1970s was around credit. First of all, women could get credit cards. And secondly, with the Community Reinvestment Act of 1978, pushed by the left inside the Democratic Party and especially uh, the Democratic Black Caucus, uh, banks were required to set aside 5% of their capital in every area in which they operated for lending into black communities. The roots of the 2007 crisis, to some extent, begin here. The attempt to solve the racial problem of the American dream through getting the financial system to play that role. Clinton was known as the black president very largely because of the enormous growth in mortgage securities that went to black families uh, in the 1990s. And those securities, a bank would lend you the money. It wouldn't hold on to that mortgage. It would package it into another security, slice it and dice it with ones that weren't as risky, put it into a uh, broader security, and sell it off to a municipality in Norway. Right? And there was an enormous appetite already in the 1990s for these securities. The appetite grew all the more as the Federal Reserve kept interest rates very low in the early 2000s in the wake of the growing deficit, partly because of the war and the tax cuts, uh, partly because after the very brief recession uh, at the beginning of the decade, there wasn't a quick rise in employment. And they kept interest rates very low. So if you're buying treasury bills, as the Chinese and Japanese and the Norwegian municipalities were doing, you know, you're not making much of a return. So they turned around and said, well, let's buy American mortgage securities. After all, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the housing agencies in the United States, yes, they're privatized, but they're really semi-public. Semi we know that the American state is going to support them no matter what. These are as good as Treasury bills. Indeed, they had AAA rating on them. So the world piled into them. Uh, and this meant that, uh, I mean, I'm concentrating here on the black portion of the American working class, but that was a small portion of it, it meant that it became very easy to get mortgages. Uh, American workers increasingly were taking out secondary mortgages on their homes as their value was going up and consuming with that, right? uh, using that to sustain their consumption as wages stagnated. Uh, uh, so you see that the crisis, in a sense, emerges out of the functionality of finance in the system, not only in terms of integrated production around the world, but in terms of the way in which the working class gets integrated into finance. Uh, and indeed, uh, when the crisis happens, finally, uh, when you know, the congressional inquiry on the crisis shows that 10,000 people with criminal records were selling mortgage securities, selling mortgages in Florida alone. 4,000 of them had fraud convictions previously. And so what happened with Bush, sure, that hadn't happened under Clinton, always happens with Republican administrations that you know, are dependent on real estate developers in every community, is that they led every shyster into the business. It made it worse. But the problem was already deeply entrained. Right? This made it worse. And the bubble burst. 
uh, the bubble burst, and it immediately then, and the onion was right, Bush could say he was proud of it, spread around the world very quickly. Even to those German banks, semi-public banks, the Landesbanken, that remain most integrated with industry. Because they had been under pressure from the European Union, which wanted more liberalized finance, that they ought to be getting a higher rate of return on their investments. So what did they do? They bought American mortgage securities. And they were the ones who took the biggest hit in Germany, uh, in fact, initially. Now, what are the characteristics of this crisis? Anybody would say what's remarkable about it is the enormous amount of state intervention. But this is nothing new. It's been the way in which our eyeglasses have been colluded by the ideology of neoliberalism that we ever thought that the neoliberal era wasn't about state intervention. It was. It was about a certain type of government action that facilitated capital accumulation. It often involved more regulation than before, not less, but the type of regulation that facilitated the flow of capital. So yes, there's been a lot of state intervention, and given the scale of the crisis, because when it's a housing crisis, this isn't only, it isn't like a crisis in the stock market. In the sense that when it's a housing crisis, the consumption capacities of working people are immediately undermined in a way they aren't in a stock market crisis. Their major asset is undermined. It affects the construction industry immediately, it affects the furniture industry immediately, it affects the uh, uh, white goods industry immediately, etc. But above all, it affects working class consumption that their sense of wealth is now gone. Right? Or not entirely gone, but diminished. Right? So it, it means that the, the consumer of first and last resort in the world, in the American economy, the basis of the tremendous Chinese capitalist boom immediately cuts back and therefore it has an immediate knock-on effect right around the world including in bringing down uh, the very high rates of growth of China, India, etc. Not bringing them down to levels that we know but nevertheless bringing them down almost inevitably. So it produced an enormous amount of intervention and the United States uh, agencies, the Treasury and Federal Reserve, have been more interventionist than most others. The Federal Reserve was lending to foreign banks from 2007 on, and it was trying to hide it, of course, uh, more than other central banks were lending to their own banks. They needed dollars desperately, and it was the American Treasury that was playing that role. And you see here the remarkable difference between the role that the American state plays and the role that the German state plays. The German Bundesbank has from all through uh, the era of global expansion been the one that has needed to be dragged, kicking and uh, screaming, into taking some responsibility for managing the global economy. Uh, it's often been said that when the rest of the world read Keynes, the Germans read Hayek in the uh, late 1940s. Uh, and they are, they are indeed very committed to, uh, you know, if you're a bank and it blows up, uh, well, you go under, whatever the consequences. Otherwise, we're engaging in moral hazard because we let you make bad decisions as a banker. But the effect of this, of course, uh, if you let certain banks go under that are very significant, is that you bring down the world payment system. Uh, in 1974, after the Bretton Woods crisis, a German bank went under, the Herstadt Bank. The Germans weren't going to bail them out. The Americans already bailed out, so with the British, two or three banks. And indeed, the world payment system was on the uh, edge of collapse. Because when one bank goes down to that size, it brings down others, including in New York. And the Americans had to drag the Germans into bailing out that bank in the beginning of the what is known as the Basel system of capital requirements. Starts at that moment uh, with the Germans finally participating in this. And you see in this crisis, for all of this stuff about a strong state, an interventionist state, coordinated economies, it is the Germans who have played the least role in managing this global crisis and the Americans that have played uh, the most with, uh, and they've often been very fed up with uh, the minimal role that the Germans have played in this respect. The second aspect of this crisis is the remarkable degree of coordination that has taken place not just among the G7 countries but amongst the G20 countries. What happened in the fall of 2008 after the uh, Lehman's went bankrupt, became clear that they weren't containing the crisis well, 
uh, uh, was that George Bush summoned the leaders, uh, not only of the G7 countries, but of the major states of the Global South, which had, through the course of the 80s and 90s and 2000s, been much more integrated into global capitalism. He called them together to Washington. The G20 was a body created after the Asian crisis uh, of finance ministers and central bankers as a means of attempting to get certain types of reforms in the financial system, the new financial architecture was called, that would make uh, it more safe, essentially make third world banks uh, uh, more open to foreign ownership so they would have more capital adequacy. And uh, uh, the first time that leaders, not just central bankers, came together of the G20 was when Bush called them to Washington in the fall of 2008. And they committed there that they would not do what states did in the 1930s. They would not interrupt the process of globalization. They would not introduce high tariffs. They would not introduce capital controls. Uh, they would commit themselves to continuing the process of capitalist globalization. And in Toronto, in that infamous month of June 2010, uh, the most important thing that happened there for all of the ugliness of what the police did to demonstrators was that they issued a communique. Yes, it was also theater. They issued a communique because it had been settled long before they arrived in Toronto. They issued a communique saying they'd made the right decision in 2008 and were going to commit themselves to continue to do this even if they now had to engage in austerity rather than a coordinated stimulus of the type that they engaged in in 2009 and led them all into heavy deficits. They would continue this commitment even if it meant they were going to lose elections as austerity leads governments to do uh, uh, to this uh, process of globalization. And they have. And that's astonishing, really, compared to the 1930s. And it reflects the difference between this crisis in the 30s, and that is the degree of coordination that exists uh, under the agency, largely, of uh, the American state. So there hasn't been conflict in this crisis between states. There also hasn't been conflict within states between the industrial and financial fractions of capitalist classes. Really, very interesting, isn't it? Everyone agrees this is a crisis that began in finance. Right? Uh, why has an industry rebelled? Right? Why has this link that was made uh, in the face of the militancy of workers in the late 1970s between financial capital and industrial capital supporting neoliberal policy, why has that not been broken? Well, it hasn't. Uh, neoliberalism is being reinforced, and it's being reinforced through a continuing alliance between financial and industrial capital under the leadership of financial capital, very largely. Where there has been conflict has been conflict inside states, and I hesitate to say here it has simply been a class conflict. It has been a class conflict, but it has involved conflict of the type we see with uh, the, the, the occupation of squares, uh, more than strikes right around the world, although there have been many one-day general strikes, of course, as part of this crisis. Uh, there has been conflict inside states in the face of this crisis. And I want to end with uh, thinking about that. Uh, one big question, I think very fair to ask, is that given this conflict inside states, will it be possible for the states of the G20 to be integrated into the American empire the way in which the states of the G7 have. To take the case of China, given the degree of class conflict that's going on in China with strike wave after strike wave, some of it, as we know, uh, in some of the suppliers to Apple, quite violent. Right? Will it be possible for the Chinese state to continue to integrate, uh, given that degree of class conflict? Uh, and in any case, we know that for reasons to do with culture and language and class structure, etc. Uh, these are, you know, we're talking about apples and oranges here. Uh, so the biggest challenge to the American state, and it's known it for a long time, has been can we integrate Brazil, South Africa, China, etc., etc., into this political umbrella of coordination, of management. And they knew it was a very difficult task. Maybe it's a more difficult task than uh, the old empires had in keeping their colonies in. Right? We have to see. Uh, so far, it ain't falling apart. From the left perspective, uh, I think we need to ask, what shape will this internal conflict, uh, which uh, uh, take, 
in order for it to become, in some ways, an effective class conflict. Uh, and and uh, the answers here are by no means clear. Uh, the strategy uh, of the Western left uh, and this was true even of the communist parties in the liberal democracies, certainly of the social democratic parties, and eventually all of the trade union movements, uh, was to win uh, uh, benefits, real reforms, uh, for their base, for their working class base, through int integrating them further into capitalism, giving them access to capitalist consumer goods, you know, giving them a degree of security in relation to pensions, but those pensions would be dependent on their institutional investment into this financial realm, right? And the functional role that finance plays. Uh, and that capitalism uh, is increasingly irrational. Uh, it's increasingly irrational, it's increasingly crisis prone. It does not appear, however, that those parties uh, and those unions uh, are capable of restructuring themselves so as to become agencies of class struggle again. Uh, when uh, the United States began in the 1945 period building this global capitalism, it was very clear, and this was said in a pamphlet produced during the war by Fortune and Life and Time magazine, but it was the State Department that was doing the thinking, the Treasury that was doing the thinking, that the greatest barrier to the making of global capitalism was the rise of the international proletariat over the previous two decades. Well, that international proletariat looked revolutionary, or at least very radical at that time. It isn't today. The big question about the Chinese class struggles taking place today is whether if an independent labor movement emerges in China, will its goal be to secure the types of uh, benefits for its work for their workers that they can become individualized consumers rather than uh, meeting collective needs through uh, a new form of socialism. But ironically, the great achievement of the working class movement uh, in the Western advanced capitalist countries was that the reforms they won uh, were won mainly to the end of making their members individual consumers. Uh, and, and the question that lies before us is, can we move on to this? Uh, the rise of Syriza in Greece, uh, a new party that uh, has roots over the last 20, 30 years in the attempt to find a way out of this impasse, it was Euro-communist currents that began it in the 1980s, that are attempting to go beyond the old reforms to take capital away from capital, to make investment decisions democratic public decisions what's to be invested, where is to be invested, how is to be invested. The essence of that initially would have to be to turn the banks into public utilities. Uh, that party, Syriza, has had this in its platform for some time. Uh, they don't call it nationalizing the banks, they call it socializing the banks. Uh, but if you think for a minute what that would entail, it would entail, and this is what the managers of the system worry about much more, it would immediately entail introducing capital controls, not only on the flow of capital inside and outside the country, but on investment within the country. And uh, what would be the consequences of doing that for a country like Greece? You know, in a way we're back to 1917. If the weakest link goes, and for the people of Greece not to suffer enormously, as a result of being pushed into that or choosing to do it, you would have to have a shift in the balance of forces elsewhere in Europe, above all in Germany, which would make the costs of doing that not so terrible. The provision of loans so that Greece would be able to buy the imports of need. Right? Uh, so breaks will happen, no doubt, whether they will happen with the types of parties capable of developing the capacities of the people that support them to understand the stakes involved, uh, whether they'll happen in a way that they can inspire similar shifts elsewhere uh, is the question that, that <coughs> faces us. Uh, in the end, and we Canadians know this better than anybody, I guess the message of Sam's in my book is that although this developments may happen everywhere, 
uh, we Canadians know very well that we can only go so far if the Americans stay on their knees, and I mean the American left, the American working class, American trade unions, etc. Uh, if there isn't a shift in the balance of forces of this kind in the United States, how far can we go? And in that sense, I think that's why so many people were so energized by Occupy. When I saw a young woman holding a sign saying the trouble with the American dream is that you need to be asleep to believe in it, wake up. <laughs> right? That wasn't only speaking to the American dream in the United States. It was speaking to the irrationality of the American dream around the world. And one has to hope that despite the uh, Occupy having lost its energy, uh, or maybe even because of it and the lessons to be learned from that, uh, we will begin to see the type of new class organizations that will try to put on the agenda getting beyond global capitalism once again. Thank you.